Hi everyone, welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian and thank you for logging on tonight. I am joined by Tim Musso. Hey guys, welcome back. And we've got a great show. So we've got some really cool watches here on the table and as always, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have about things going on in the industry, the watches here on the table or watches in general and we are always happy to help and answer. Let's roll. Let's, Let's roll, roll with a simple watch first. A simple watch from a great brand, and in my opinion, one of the best three-hand paddocks of the last 20 years. So this is a rare beast, a watch that you will not see very often at all. So this is a Paddock Philippe Reference 5107 Platinum. Um, and you can tell that it's platinum there by the diamond at 6 o'clock right there underneath, and also by the heft of the watch. So the lineage of this watch is you have the 5107, which was then replaced by the 5127, which was then replaced by the current version of the watch, which looks nothing like the prior two is the 5227. Um, what's so special to me about this watch is A, the fact that they uh, never did a 5127 in platinum and is just, you know, the, the beauty of the black lacquer dial, um, the weight of the watch and just that it's, you know, automatic watch with a date and I just think that it was executed absolutely beautifully and at 30, 37 millimeter, yes. it's just an amazing size and it's got a great heft to it. I'll say there are a couple of different schools of thought when it comes to modern Calatrava. There are those who say it has to be strictly based on the lines and dial layout of the old Reference 96, which would mean no crown guards, flat bezel, small seconds. Many would say that today it comes down to classicists who prefer that layout and those who prefer the more modernized Calatravas with crown guards, center seconds, date wheels. I happen to prefer the more modern school of thought when it comes to Calatrava design. To me, this feels like a contemporary men's watch. And although it lapsed in 2005, that was the last year for this model, it still feels incredibly contemporary. There's something timeless about this design. Apart from the fact that it's built to last, the design was crafted to last, and I feel like this was probably as good as it got in three-hand Calatravas during the 2000s, and maybe even over the last 20 years, inclusive. I love this watch. By the way, very flat bezel. That's how you can tell a 5127 from a 5107. Almost completely flat bezel on the 07. The 27 is more clearly conical. Yeah, and you know, this watch is also, uh, you know, caliber 315 and features the Geneva seal. So obviously, Patek Philippe uh, transitioned from the Geneva seal to the Patek Philippe seal, but you know, just a uh, you know, nice feature on there that differentiates it from some of the newer models. Um, and I also think that the platinum happens to add a, you know, a weight to the watch that lends itself to feeling a little bit bigger than it is. And as you mentioned with the uh, crown protector there, it's definitely got more of a contemporary modern feel. And I think that it's a really cool, unique option that you'll never see on somebody's wrist. The crown guard does give it a bigger profile. It looks more like a 39 on the yeah. wrist, which I think most people would think is probably ideal for a modern men's watch. If you want to look at something that is very modern and right in that 38 to 40 millimeter size range, let's go straight for what might be the most impressive single dress watch on the table tonight. Let's go for Laurent Ferrier. First, let me give a shout out to my friends. Matt Turner joining from England, staying up from New England. Paul S., Robert Dixon from Scotland, Hell Bop, Steve, just met him today, one of our customers and friends, the fat gent joining us, catching a live show, he says, Adrian Cohen, Brick Lane, Andre T., welcome, guys. Thank you so much for joining, and Mark O. Hey, tell me, let's, let's try to find the most far-flung fans. If you think you are farthest away, the most unusual location, time zone, or circumstance, let me know in the chat box. I'll we be minding that. hello from Iran, so I'd say that's pretty far away. All right, cool. Which city in Iran? Let us know. Guys, thank you so much. I, and by the way, thank you for staying up literally all night to watch us from the Middle East. Big thanks right there. Laurent Ferrier, you guys have earned it. Let's go straight for the Montre Ecole. So this is a watch that Laurent Ferrier is producing only in stainless steel. It has a gold-coated movement on the back there, which Tim will show, which looks absolutely magnificent. And I believe that this is the only watch that he does do this coating on. The rest of the movements that he does is the more traditional uh, brass styling. Um, but the watch is beautifully executed. I think that it has all the hallmarks that one would expect in Laurent Ferrier. I particularly like the fact that it is stainless steel. I do enjoy that he is one of the few manufacturers that will give a client the opportunity to produce a watch in the metal of their choice. Uh, and if they do want uh, you know, to purchase the watch in stainless, they can. I believe this was only produced in stainless, though. 
This is the ultimate stealth bomber, and at least through the first decade or so of Laurent Ferrier, that's been the theme of the brand. Their tourbillon was almost too discreet. They had to create a dial side variant of their tourbillon because they were almost too modest about their movements. The dial is almost austere. Applique indices at 12, 3, and 9. The Asagai or spear style white gold hands at center, but then just a vertical satin grain and a few blue accents. The timepiece really comes alive when you rotate it over the case inspired by Laurent Ferrier's Montre École or his school watch, the first watch he created. The movement is anything but vintage, however. This was created with La Fabrique du Temps, which is Louis Vuitton's high-end movement manufacturer. So you have FBN for Barbicini and Nivaz, the principles of Fabrique du Temps, and the F for Ferrier. They combined to create this movement, which is a micro rotor, 72 hour power reserve with twin escape wheels and nickel phosphorus and a silicon oscillator. It is a double direct impulse system. So very efficient, very tech. And I'm gonna do my best to wind this one backwards because you really do deserve to see it in action. It has a wonderfully vintage cadence to it because of the oscillations of the two separate escapement components and this watch when fully activated or fully energized I should say has a three-day power reserve brought about largely by the efficiency of the escape not the fact that it has a huge mainspring barrel which it doesn't I need to wind this one more quickly guys but the important thing about this movement is that it proves you can have a high-tech traditionally finished caliber there we go there we go the thing about a double direct impulse escapement, guys, is that it requires a little bit of help to start. Overcoming the initial friction, and this is this goes back to the very first natural escapements built by Breguet, they always require a little bit of help. The only one that starts itself every time is the FP Journe Chronomet Optimum. Now you can see those twin nickel phosphorus escape wheels directly impulsing the balance. There's a silicon oscillator between them, one huge mainspring barrel, and count them, one, two, three, four interior angles on this movement's finish. I don't know how close we can get, guys. Can we see those? But the half bridge for the balance is both black polished and quadruply executed with interior angles. Guilloche cut on the pawl-based winding system. It's a jeweled staff with a pawl, so the winding rotor is very smooth as it moves along. And you can probably better see those twin escape wheels from this angle. But you pay for what's inside this watch. And fortunately, because it's in steel, you pay for the watchmaking, not for precious metal. Correct. And, you know, there's a couple of, uh, um, a little bit of feedback from the chat just sort of saying that they don't absolutely love the dial. Um, so me personally, I do think that it blends in a little bit too much with the color of the metal. And I think that at times it could probably be a little bit hard to read. Um, somebody mentioned that they would really enjoy seeing this watch with a salmon dial. I, you know, I tend to agree. I think like a gray blue, uh, a salmon, you know, maybe something other than sort of just the, 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 the brush silver. Um, but again, I think that the, he was going for something a little bit more utilitarian and simplistic like this. The nice thing about that watch is it's totally below the radar. Aside from the fact that the case looks a little bit antique th there's nothing to give that watch away. Whereas when you're wearing even an FP Journe, you can get an FP Journe that is almost pornographic in its case form. Something like the, the, the Vagabondage declares itself despite its discrete dimensions. Uh, this thing... Is it alpaca underneath the strap? Is that what he uses? What does it use underneath the strap here? I, I, I know it makes it more sweat resistant. It, it's, it, it's either alpaca or I think it might be kudu. Yeah, I think it's an alpaca material that he uses underneath the strap in order to make it more uh, sweat resistant. So it beads instead of... Uh, yeah, think suede. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, beautiful watch nonetheless. And then what is the um, terminology for the type of hands that he uses? Asagai. It is a type of native African spear that has that particular form and, and that's the French terminology for it. And as far as I know, they're the only ones who use that hand on both hours and minutes. A very cool thing, but I have to say, we have a watch that will make you reconsider precious metal. In spite of the glory of the steel Laurent Ferrier, there's something to be said of Rolex's old Cellini 5241 in platinum. This is a K series, and back when I was in high school, this was pretty much the ultimate dress Rolex. White gold indices, white gold hands. You can see the concentric circular pattern, almost record style of the hour track and the metallic tinge of the center dial in sunburst fashion. It is gloriously slim, compact, understated, and 
anti-sports watch. I can rarely say that of a Rolex. This is almost like a polemic against the sports watch Rolex. The rotating bezel, the dive style, the full bracelet, all in platinum. And uniquely, because of the way the case is made, you can see the reference and the serial number on the case back. Manual wind Rolex dress watch. About as good as it gets at 38.5 millimeters with a timeless style and size. The one feature of this watch that really distinguishes it, besides the ice blue Rolex glacier style platinum dial is the width of the bezel that gives it a certain visual strength in conjunction with the large stepped out lugs. So though it's not a big watch, it does have an outsized personality and a commanding wrist presence. And that's all down to the bezel and the lugs. That dial, by the way, worth the price of admission by itself. And hey, how often do you see manual wind Rolex? Exactly. So I picked the watch just because I thought it was definitely a sleeper. And Rolex definitely doesn't get enough credibility for their more traditional dress watches. This has actually been uh, discontinued for some years now. Uh, they, you know, completely redid the Cellini line. Uh, but I, what I particularly like is that ice blue dial, since as most of you know, Rolex will only do the ice blue on their platinum pieces. Uh, you know, it's a very uh, interesting way to get a platinum glacier piece. Um, at actually like incredible value. So I just, you know, I think that it's got a very unique look. You're not gonna see many other dress watches with this sort of color combination. And, um, you know, I really think that Rolex hit it out of the park, but with so much uh, emphasis on their sport models and their, you know, their... Um, just out of curiosity, do you know what we're asking for this ballpark figure? I, th I know that we're asking under 10. Yeah, I was gonna say, this is kind of the thinking man's sleeper Repost to waiting a year for a chronomet bleu. There's there's no lack of pedigree here or durability, everyday wearability or history. This is the real deal, and I would easily say that if you want to spend half or less of the retail price of a chronomet bleu, wear something with the same level of discretion, style, and timeless appeal, this would be a great way to go. It's almost the Rolex for the anti-Rolex guy. Love that piece. Yeah. Uh, JBO Surf, Tim and Brian, have you seen the new Lang Datagraph with Loom and Sapphire Face? Thoughts? Uh, I would say who in the watch world hasn't seen it, considering that it has been on, I'd say, every blogger and forum imaginable. But um, I have seen it. I actually happen to think it's very cool. Um, I really do think that uh, Langa should do more watches like that. I think that it's sort of, um, I don't want to say it's outside the box at this point, because they have done prior versions of the Lumen. But I definitely think that... Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a very cool look. It's going to do incredibly well. Um, there's definitely not going to be enough of them. I think it's what only 200 pieces. 200 and pieces. It's 100 thousand dollar retail. So I'm sure it'll be a over retail watch. But um, no, I think they executed really nicely. I think that it was the right watch to choose for the next watch in the collection. And um, you know, as I said, I wish I would uh, that they would do more pieces like it. I'm actually happy that they keep it relatively constrained because if there's one thing you can say about Longa, it's as beautiful as they are, they do seem to make more watches than the market can handle. Mm -hmm. They did their first Lumen back in 2011, another in 2013, another edition in 2015, and that feels about the right cadence to me. I wouldn't want to see more than 200 per edition. That's the largest Lumen edition they've done. And I wouldn't want to see them more than every two years or so. I'd like to see Longa have a strong, low volume, continuously available steel piece, like something wait-listed, but in the catalog every year, then necessarily see them expand. Well, they need a sport collection. model. I mean, that's yeah. the one That's the one piece of the collection that they're, that they're desperately missing. Yeah. Or even just a steel watch. I think a dress watch in steel with a bracelet could work really well if it's not too dressy. I'll say this, the best thing about the new Dato Lumen is that it has a purpose to it. It's not just cool looking. They made all of the functions of the watch usable and visible. So you can see the time, but you can also use the chronograph and read all of its registers and scales by night. And that is what really sets this edition apart. It's not just there to look cool. It does expand the functionality of the datagraph to full nighttime usage. And I think that's a cool notion because it's purposeful and it's cool. And let's face it, the Germans are, are nothing if not practical. <laughs> And uh, no, I mean, there's been a lot of feedback on, you know, um, you know, you know, is this, you know, is it nicer, you know, how does this, you know, pair up against the original? And I think that it's a, you know, it's not really a comparison that you can make because, um, you know, I guess the, the original data graph would probably be considered one of the best chronograph movements of all time. And, but it's got a very, you know, it's got a much more surgical look. I mean, this is supposed to be more modern. 
Um, and I think that you know it very much does fit in line that you could have this and one of the original ones as well. Yeah, it certainly allows you to build a collection. Datagraph would be a great collection theme, and I have to say, of all the data graphs you could own, oddly, the 1998 roughly 30-piece Dato in yellow gold would probably be the brass ring. That's the one that no one can find. Yeah. I've seen pictures of one. It was on a full bracelet. <laughs> so yeah, but definitely. they could have probably done more than 200. That's my the only my only qualm is that I think that the you know sometimes they'll make too many of one watch that the market can bear, and then you know an addition like this where obviously they're keeping it in line with the other lumens, they probably could have produced more. They certainly could. I do think it's best in the watch industry to always leave them wanting more of the Rolex strategy. I, I would say there definitely needs to be more balance across the Longa catalog. They have a lot of watches that are dead sexy but don't necessarily sell well. And then they have a couple of watches that could definitely sell if they made them, but might diminish the appeal if they did so. So I think the key thing they need is to find some sort of consistency. And let's face it, not many brands have balance today. Audemars Piguet, we talked about them being red hot, they're going vertical, they're so scarce, but we're really only talking about steel royal oaks. And then there's everything else they make. When was the last time you ordered a bespoke pocket watch? Or, or Patek Philippe, they're strong, but I guarantee you, if you want to get some sort of precious metal grand complication, you put in the application, Terry Stern approves it, you get your watch. No, I disagree. I think that they're the most well-rounded, I would say, of all of the brands in terms of having every single category um, touched on and at a very high level. I think Rolex is probably the best rounded because even Rolex's gold pieces are in demand right now. I would say Patek Philippe is strong in steel. The basic Calatravas sell decently. But Rolex is strong in sport models. Yeah, but Rolex also is able to sell gold sports models. I, I don't think there's necessarily the same pull for a 5164 in ro or 5167 in rose gold that there is for steel. Yeah, the other is. thing is, with 20% of its production being steel, it, it, again, I, I've seen a lot of grand comp heavy style pieces from Patek available. And, and I do think that that's the kind of thing that is great for buyers, like absolutely awesome for buyers. But I don't think any company right now is stronger than Rolex, except maybe F.P. Journe because he can vary his production so much. He can concentrate on the three or four models that are doing well, and that could be two-thirds of his yearly production. Like, he has a better ability to balance. But I, I, I mean, again, though, but that's, you're talking he makes 560 watches a, yeah. a year. So, you you know, from a production you know standpoint, I mean, there are F.P. Journe watches available. I mean, if you want a chronometric blue, you're going yeah. to wait. But for most other pieces, I mean... You know, you they are obtainable versus paddock where they're pretty much just not obtainable. Yeah, well, the, the steel paddocks are not obtainable. The thing about F.P. Journe, though, is... 5270 Platinum, like salmon you, dial, not going to be obtainable. The yeah. Nautilus Perpetual, not going to be obtainable. But you're talking about, like, uh, one model among many. You go into Patek's catalog and you realize how many Metate art they make that we've never seen. Yeah, but it's because they make, you know, one or two. Yeah. So the, the key thing is that, realistically... I would say at the moment, selling a sports watch of any description is a great thing. There are very few dress watch brands that are super strong. Uh, I would say among dress watches, I mean, F.P. Journe's pretty much the only company that's super strong in dress watches and pretty much only dress watches. Like, I don't know any dress watch company that's red hot right now. Can you think of one? No, I mean, again, I would say, uh, you know, it brings me back to, I would say, Patek Philippe. Just because, again, when you go down the collection and you start looking, you know, 5396Gs, not easy to get right now. 5146Gs, three-month waits. 5320G, very difficult to get. So, like, when you actually go, th go through their collection watch by watch, again, they're doing incredibly well. Even to the ladies' pieces. Again, ladies' Nautilus is on fire. Luce's on fire. Ladies' that's, complications on fire. That's always been their best-selling model. But, they, don't, they don't always talk about it, but the 4910, the 24, is their best-selling single model. So I, I applaud that. But uh, but no, so that, that's why, you know, if you go product line by product line, I think that, like, obviously, you know, they, you know, they, they do the most and other brands might do one segment really well, but you know they, they encapsulate everything. I think ultimately the lesson right now is that the market is very interested in one thing. Patek probably has the most interesting across the board strength and they're one of the few companies that can sell gold models and colored gold models on the strength of brand. 
Not many companies can do that. I'll also say this. What do you think of the new 24 ladies uh, uh, mechanical? Is it a pander? Is it borderline insulting? Because I saw it and I just like slapped my head. It's a nice watch objectively, but should it have been steel without diamonds? No, I mean, I think that they, you know, I don't think that they were looking to recreate just the stainless steel quartz 24 that they had had previously. They were looking for, um, they were looking for a new watch. They were looking for a, you know, sophisticated automatic watch that, uh, you know, call it would, you know, compete with Nautilus, but would be for a completely different look. And, you know, all things aside, price point wise, at, you know, I believe it's like $26,000 retail for an automatic movement with diamonds. Um, it's probably what ten thousand dollars more than than you know a comparable Rolex, but still you're getting a hand finished Patek Philippe movement for you know for that difference, and I think they knocked it out of the park. The watch is going to be scarce; it's going to be difficult to get. I think that um, it's touching on a different consumer, and they're still keeping the original twenty four. I still feel like a mid size Aquanaut, a Nautilus, or even a Nautilus or an Aquanaut is the ultimate ladies Patek watch. Like if you're if you're a woman and you want an absolute no compromise Patek Philippe, you're probably not going for the one that they made for ladies. It's like Scion. As soon as you, you tell kids, hey kids, we built this one for you, they flee. So I, I would not be surprised if the women who are really into watches are going straight for the steel Patek sports models like everyone else. But you know what, I think availability is extremely difficult and it's hard enough for, you know, I don't want to segment it by guys versus girls, but I think that it's hard enough for your, your you know, your, normal Patek Philippe collectors and even, you know, to get those watches. So, but again, I think that it touched on a, you know, there was a very much a need for um, a round automatic, you know, ladies paddock that wasn't sort of in the market yet. And I think that, you know, they're going to be, obviously they're not, they're not going to that's, produce the numbers yeah. of this watch as they did the Quartz 24. So that's let's talk about a watch difference. that's equally applicable to both. This is a 38 millimeter men's offshore. It's the old school reference 25807 steel. It uses a Shishara LeCoult calendar module and it is a triple calendar with a radial date indicator, but it's the 38 millimeter case that sets this one apart. This is a slim watch because it's JLC 889 base and it's also a wearable watch because fundamentally it's a 38 that wears like a 40 or a 41. Original tritium dial. These are very old school and this one a D series dating back to the mid 1990s roughly 1995 1996 for this watch with a late D series serial and it's listed number 71 on the back and I believe this is literally the 71st 25807. Should there be a return to form? Should there be a return to market for this watch? So I mean I Personally, there's virtually no offshore that fits my wrist, and I think that that's one of my biggest qualms with the line, is that even the diver I can't really wear. And, you know... This is I, the diver, by the way, guys. Here we've got a diver right here. So, obviously, you know, it's much more massive, and, you know, the 38 millimeter size of this offshore happens to fit me incredibly well. Um, you know, they do do a 30, I believe it's a 37 millimeter ladies offshore, but I do think that there is room in the collection to bring back a, you know, a, a 30 millimeter offshore like this. Um, do I absolutely love the, the dial itself and the layout? I mean, again, it's not my favorite, but, um, I do think that it's a very cool watch. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's powered by a JLC movement. Triple calendar, I think is a cool complication. Um, and my favorite part about it is that it's on a bracelet and you have the the ability to put it on a strap and then back to a bracelet again. Yeah, the thing about this generation of Royal Oaks is that there were two different lug junctions. There was a hinge style lug for the watches that came on straps and then there was this double intermediate plot style junction which is what every offshore uses today. But if you got the watch on the bracelet, you could fit it to a bracelet or a strap that was made for this junction. If you got the one on the strap, you could only ever fit it to that single pivot strap. You could never put it on a bracelet. So if you're gonna buy one of these, even if you want it on a strap, buy it with the bracelet, keep the 
the bracelet and put it on a strap because you can convert from bracelet to strap. You can't go the other way if you get a watch that was designed for a strap from the beginning. Another thing that I want to remind people of is these early Royal Oaks or Royal Oak Offshores with the JLC movements were often incredibly slim. The first of the scubas was under 13 millimeters thick and that was an offshore diver. Now this is a contemporary offshore diver. This is part of the series that bowed in 2017. They were the color divers. There were a couple of crazy candy colors and this was the, this was, I believe we were saying this is a boutique model. This is not the Geneva boutique model. Correct. This was a boutique, boutique exclusive. Yes. So, and you know, obviously you can see the differential in the thickness and the overall size of the watch. Um, back to the 38 millimeter piece, you know, like most Royal Oaks and offshores, it's going to fit a little bit larger than the millimeter case size suggests. So even at 38, the watch does fit a little bit bigger. And again, I, I think that it's, for me personally, this is like the perfect size. I love the, the, the chunkiness of the bracelet too, I think is really nice. And I think that the, the size of the bracelet relative to the watch uh, was also done incredibly well. Like the bracelet's not too thin for the case or too thick. By the way, guys, I apologize for the freezer aisle appearance of this particular watch. It's shrink wrapped because it just came back from AP service. So happily, this watch just came back from Le Brasseau with factory warranty. Therefore, we shall allow you first night privileges. I shall keep it sheathed for your protection. The timepiece that we're gonna discuss now is one that does let you see the case back. That was one of the things about the early offshores. They have internal anti-magnetic shielding, and that was possible because the JLC movement was so thin. The later 3120s, especially when modular with chronographs, were thicker. They are thicker movements. This movement is just under four and a half millimeters thick versus 3.25 for the JLC. But what you get is a 55 to 60 hour power reserve, automatic winding. You get a solid gold winding mass in an era when we are increasingly seeing, even on luxury models tungsten carbide winding masses and I don't like that I don't like that trend I don't think it's appropriate for luxury what you do get here too is a reminder that AP is still in the hands of the founding families as you have the coats of arms of both Audemars and Piguet families engraved into the rotor now full bridge and free sprung you can see this movement was always ever designed for the offshores first when brian says he'd like to see a return to mid-sized royal oaks i think what would really be great would be if royal we oak had offshores Yes, yes, Royal Oak Offshores. I think it would be great if we had something about the size of the current 15450, like a midsize, mm -hmm. and then built an offshore on that base. So keep it under 40 millimeters, and, and I would also say keep it under 14 millimeters thick. It would be great if you can add complications, but if not, just make not a kinder, gentler, but a more appropriate offshore, because this you can wear anywhere. This is difficult to wear to the office unless the office is a bathyscaphe. And speaking of which, we have one on the table. I like that transition. Isn't that slick? That's practice. <laughs> okay, tell me what we're looking at, Brian. So we are looking at a 43 millimeter titanium bath escape um, uh, from Blanc Pond. So this happens to be one of the uh, my favorite watches that they're currently producing. Um, I you know I don't really want to call it. Uh, I think you called it the uh, the the baby 50 fathoms, um, but I think that it definitely hits uh, you know a different checkbox. I think that the watch is uh, obviously more slim. Uh, for me, it's a little bit more wearable. Um, you know, I don't want to call it an upscale Submariner, um, but I do think that this is that sort of watch that uh, if you're looking for something sporty uh, that you're not going to see many other individuals wearing. That's available both on NATO, you can get it on a rubber strap as well, and I think that it does really make a nice option. And here's the other thing that I love about this. The watch is 43 millimeters and it's just over 13 millimeters thick. So it's fairly slim despite being an automatic diver with a five day power reserve and a 300 meter water resistance. So I took off this NATO strap, by the way, one of the best NATO straps you'll ever encounter because even the strap minders are made of finished metal. This one in titanium, it's an impressive spec. But let's get back to the caliber. It's exactly what you would get in the standard 5015. The Bathyscaphe is the 5000 reference. You're you're getting caliber 1315, free sprung, three main spring barrels, five day power reserve, and thankfully, although it is PVD coated black, it is a gold winding mass. You're getting a level of finish that you won't get in a Rolex. So this is a viable alternative as a pre-owned watch to something like a Rolex sub. Don't wait in line for a watch that won't let you see that for which you've paid. If you're a movement guy, you want tech, you want power reserve, refinement, silicon hairspring, display case back, 
three main spring barrels, all of that going inside a case that is more vintage inspired and perhaps more discreet than the standard 50 fathoms, by the way, ceramic bezel. Now they this do make a great one that option. is a gray blue coloring, which I do they think, do. which I, which is my preferred version of the watch. There, there are several versions now, ceramic cases, ceramized cases, steel cases, and by the way, ceramic cases in several different colored ceramic, mm -hmm. uh, blue, gray, uh, of course, this watch in titanium, there's a steel version, and a couple of different strap and even a bracelet option. You'll love the vintage 70s inspired rectangular baton hands with their little syringe extensions. It's not quite as grandiose as the 5015, and for a lot of folks, this is the best option in the Blancpain dive watch class. Uh, they have a lot of options from 38 millimeters up to, I mean, over 50 with the X Fathoms, but this is probably the best all arounder that they offer. How do you feel about the date being between three and four? Do you think it would have been better positioned at three? No, I actually. Sorry, between four and five. I, I actually like it, and we'll just go back to the dial real quick. We'll sign off on this. I like the fact that they maintained the symmetry of the indices. Some folks have issues with the date. I like it because I use my watches, and I like to see the date when I'm writing correspondence or emails. And you will see that keeping the indices at the four corners gives the dial a symmetry, especially with the monotone date disc being fairly minimalist. I feel if it were at one of the four corners, it would be more prominent, insistent, and it would break up some of the symmetry of the the dial, I'm okay with it. I, I think that if you're going to go with a diver as an everyday watch, a date makes sense. If it's a vintage tribute, maybe an occasional thing, then just dispense with the date altogether. I think it's that's really the question. Do you, do you take up one of the indices and make it a, a balancing element or a balancing act on the mm -hmm. dial? Because mm -hmm. let's show how that works. Or do you move it off center and keep oh, the yeah. indices intact? Yeah. Well, so, um, I mean, difficult choice because I think that, you know, obviously if you took away the date, it definitely would simplify the watch a little bit. But I think that the consumer or the customer that's buying this watch does want a date. Um, so, um, in, you know, I think that Omega um, really took it to heart in that they, you know, they put a date on there. It's, um, you know, it's small. It's at the bottom of the watch. They took up an indice. Um, I think that it's sort of... Uh, it's not imposing at all, and I actually think it was a very nice way of doing it. In that, um, you know, it's there if you need it. It's there if you want a date, but you know, it's not. Uh, it's definitely not looming. Yeah. By the way, guys. No pun intended. Two th 2018 25th anniversary diver 300. Uh, between these, uh, I own the original version of this watch. I would still take the Bathyscaph. It's richer. It is actually lower in profile than the Omega. The Omega is more insistent and flamboyant than the more expensive Blancpain. So score one for discretion. I would go with the Bathyscaph between these two. Okay. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for thank joining us. Thank you guys us. for logging on. Um, as always, guys, please feel free to email Tim or myself uh, if you have any questions or if there's any watches that uh, you want brought into the show for next week because, uh, you know, we're here for you guys. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian. I'm Tim. And thank you guys for logging on.